this is such a beautiful poem about love but the problem with it is that when most students start reading it they get completely thrown by the Shakespearean language and they don't know what it means and they're trying so hard just to understand it that they then can't get to the sort of deeper analysis deeper meaning so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure you fully comprehend this poem and you know how to analyze it and if I may be so bold that you actually come to quite like it possibly even love it like I do. When students are struggling to understand Shakespeare, part of that reason is the way he does his grammar is really different to us today. Now, if you're looking for more detailed advice on how to read Shakespeare, you need to go check out my video on that because I go through loads of detail on how you can actually read Shakespeare in English, understand Shakespeare in English way easier. And it'll help you out with his poems, his plays, whatever you're studying to do with him. For the purposes of this though, I'm just gonna essentially translate things for you. So he says, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. That basically means don't, I, I refuse to admit, I refuse to acknowledge that there can be obstacles and problems when you have a marriage of true minds. So the key words that are worth pointing out here, first of all, is like the impediments, okay? So that use of the word impediments is specifically interesting because that word actually gets used in marriage vows. Um, impediment just means like a problem or an obstacle to achieving something um, and in marriage vows in typically like Western Christian faith you have this line about if anyone knows of a lawful or just impediment why these two people should not be married things like that so it's this idea of during a wedding ceremony you are supposed to be allowed to declare if you know some reason why these two people shouldn't get to be married so what he's essentially alluding to is marriage vows and the sort of official wording within marriage vows and i'll come back to that in a second in terms of what the significance of that is before that though now that we understand that what he's basically saying is I will not accept that there are obstacles in a marriage of true minds. We need to break down that marriage of true minds bit and understand what he's saying there. So first of all, obviously a marriage is between two people, right? But he's referring to them as minds. And so what he's doing is he's using a technique called synecdoche. Now synecdoche is where you use a part of something to represent its whole under this idea that that part of it is a great representation, is a great symbol of the bigger picture of it. So in the case of minds, he's using the mind to represent the whole of the people, the whole of their relationship. And if it's being called true, that has connotations of being like real, of being, you know, fitting together, of matching up. So when we look at the synecdoche of minds, we can see that what he's talking about is the values, the beliefs, the personalities of the two people. So if they're true minds, it's two people that have a great connection with each other. They really get along, they really understand each other, you know, good friends. That basic principle we still have today that, you know, your spouse is your best friend. So when we go back to this line as a whole then, what he's essentially saying is, I will not accept that there are obstacles in a love, in a marriage between two people that truly get each other and understand each other and want to be together. That is important, historically speaking, contextually speaking. In the time that Shakespeare is writing, it's really common to not get married for reasons of love, but to get married for reasons of money, power, politics, building family relations. What Shakespeare is trying to explore here is what to him true love is all about. And clearly what we can see from this opening line to him, true love is not about, oh yeah, our parents are gonna make so much money off of our marriage, or oh yeah, I'm gonna have so much more political power by being married to you. True love, a proper marriage, is about two people that truly connect with one another. And that's actually a pretty darn big deal for him to be saying something like that in this time period where it is so uncommon for people, particularly in the higher classes, to be getting married for love. So let's return to why he's got these marriage vows in this opening line to begin with. Marriage is essentially the most formal legal way of looking at love. It's a legally binding relationship between two people. 
And as part of that, as part of marriage, there almost has to be this acknowledgement of obstacles and challenges that you face as part of being married. And he is saying, no, there are no obstacles. There are no challenges. You don't even need to have a vow about impediments if you are truly connected with, with one another, if you truly love one another. So he's almost in a way looking at what a condition should be of two people who get married. The fact that they should be able to be really connected to each other, be really truly in love with each other. And he goes now into that in more detail by looking at love itself. And he says, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. In other words, it's not love when your love changes if something about the other person changes. So love alters when it finds alterations. Love should not change when it finds changes. Similarly, bends with the remover to remove. So it doesn't give in to someone who's trying to get rid of the love. It doesn't, you don't stop loving someone if they maybe try to stop loving you back or something like that. So this image is all about love's perseverance. Now in terms of breaking down the sort of craft of how Shakespeare is doing all of that, there's a couple of different techniques you wanna have a look at. So the first is gonna sound ridiculously confusing, but trust me, it's not that big of a deal, but it's called polyptoton. I'm gonna let you, while I just highlight these words, I'm gonna let you guess how on earth you spell polyptoton. And then you can feel all cocky as I write it and you can see that you've got the spelling correct. Um, so polyptoton is when you repeatedly use words that come from the same sort of root, but you're using their different forms. So like alteration and alters. Alteration is the noun, alters is the verb. Remover is the noun, remove is the verb. So he's using the same word, but in its different word forms. And why is he doing that? If he was saying love does this, right? If he was saying love alters when it alteration finds, love bends with the remover to remove. What the polyptoton essentially does is really beautifully create that feeling of causation. So because there is an alteration, something alters. Because there is a remover, we remove. By using the same root word, it creates a really nice causational relationship between those two words. However, what we've got here is of course a big fat no in front of it. So what you've got is the negation of that polyptoton, the negation of that causality. It should not be that just because something changes, your love changes. Just because the other person perhaps doesn't love you as much anymore, you don't love that other person. So what the negation of the polyptoton does is highlight that love should be fixed when other things change. So if you have a look at our root words, right? And what is the pattern of our root words in the polyptoton? It's all about change, alter, remove, bend you could argue as part of that as well like i would almost call that part of like a semantic field of change oh that pink has just massively <laughs> ruined the color of everything so when we've got this semantic field of change in the polyptoton being negated what it does is create the opposite meaning to the words right like when you say you're not cold you mean the opposite of cold. When you say you're not happy, you mean the opposite of happy. So to have the semantic field of change be negated, he essentially creates the opposite meaning about love. Love is constant, love is unchanging. So by exploring what love is not, he also is able to explore what love is. So that's our first quatrain. Now a quatrain is just a group of four lines. And when we come back later to looking at the sort of whole stretch of the poem and the fact that it's a sonnet, I'll say a little bit more about that. But this, we can think of this group as all being together as sort of looking at what love is not. Once he's established that love is unchanging, he keeps going by saying, oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. 
So the it is an ever fixed mark. Ever fixed mark is like a navigation reference. So thinking of, and I do not profess to be an expert on sailing in any way here, so bear with me, but back before any kind of advanced tech in our 16th century, that ever fixed mark could be that like star in the sky that sailors can use to guide their ship because they know like if that's the north star head that way and i'm going north right so it's a sailing reference and we have that metaphor continued the tempest that just means a really violent storm the ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken is calling love something that gives us our sense of direction our sort of guide in life our navigation just like that ever fixed mark helps our sailors know where they're going so if we think about what the tempest represents that's essentially the same as an impediment right it's a continuation of that idea a very violent storm is the challenge that the sailor is facing in trying to sail their ship it's the obstacle there's potentially also an element of pathetic fallacy maybe the tempest is like a symbol of like anger however it's again negated never shaken so you can see how serious that adverb is never and we're going to come back to the sort of tone that's being created by words like never because he uses never a few different times um, but it's really really strong like it's never shaken so shaken would suggest similar to our semantic field of change in fact you know what i'm going to add it back into our semantic field of change as well it's a continuation of that idea of no matter what the obstacle love is not affected instead love just keeps being fixed and constant and guiding us through these difficult times. I'm now gonna come back to that tone of the poem that is now starting to build over lots of different terms. And the tone is one of a sense of like certainty, but also passion as well. Like our speaker of this poem, who we don't really know anything about their identity. Most people just treat it as if it's like Shakespeare, but it doesn't really matter who it is. It's just someone talking about their view of love. And this person, feels so certain in their feelings and feels really strongly, passionately about it as well. So I'm gonna show you from what we've looked at so far, how are we seeing that certainty? How are we seeing that passion, okay? So first of all, that imperative in the let me not, that refusal to accept that there can be these obstacles in love. Then you've also got the adverb like never, that strength, that firmness of that adverb really showing that there is, there is no other way about it, right? It's, it's just not shaken. You've also got this, oh no. Now this is a te technique that again, is gonna have some really fancy sounding, weird Greek name, but is really not as complicated as it sounds at all. And the technique is called ekphenesis. And again, you can have a moment of trying to predict how I'm about to spell ekphenesis and feel very cocky when you go and spell it correctly like me. So ekphenesis is essentially a short ex emotional exclamatory in a poem. It can also be in a drama or in a song, but obviously here we're dealing with a poem. So it's a short exclamatory sort of outburst almost of emotion in a poem because essentially it's being like, oh no, like, love is not that, love is this. And it's just this really emphatic, determined expression of his view. And that's of course part of creating that tone of certainty and that passion with which he feels his view. And it's also part, I think, of the sort of, as we go through this poem, he gets more passionate, more certain, because he gets more metaphorical. He gets more sort of abstract in the way he's talking about love. So he's going to start off with talking about love in its most sort of legal, formal sense of marriage. And by the end, he's talking about doom and bending sickle's compass, and it's all gonna get very deeply metaphorical. And I think that's part of reflecting that increasing passion and certainty with which he is speaking. The fact that he feels the need to speak more and more metaphorically. I wanna just add, by the way, I have seen versions of this sonnet where they don't use an exclamation mark after oh no they say oh no comma just to stress i would argue you can still call it ekphenesis because even without the exclamatory sen even without 
the exclamation mark, it is still an exclamatory phrase. It's still expressing a sort of strong passion, strong emotion in a very sort of brief phrase. So even if your version of this poem has a comma, not an exclamation mark, this analysis still stands. We're gonna go back now, and I will keep pointing out more things for tone as it comes up, but we're gonna go back to our metaphor, our sailing metaphor, because he extends that over the next two lines. So remember, he's just finished telling us that love is this this constant guidance that we can rely on in difficult times and love is never affected by these obstacles by these difficult times he says it is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although his height be taken so the star to every wandering bark that's a continuation of the ever fixed mark and the tempest in the sense that an a wandering bark is just a ship so the fact that it's wandering suggests that it's lost. So it's a lost ship. It is a star to every lost ship. So it's a guide to someone who is lost. So the wandering bark in this metaphor is arguably people. So it gives support, it gives purpose, it gives guidance to people who are lost. He also then looks at the star metaphor from a slightly different angle, not so much a sailing angle, um, that really speaks as well to the power of love because he says, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. So the his in that his height be taken is the star itself. If you think about stars on a scientific level, right? What he's essentially saying is that scientifically you can be like, that is a star, this is what it is, this is how big it is, this is how far away it is, this is its size, etc. You know, you can really break it down and analyze it in a specific scientific way. But that doesn't mean you can name its value. That doesn't mean you can name its worth. And he's exploring this idea of how, yes, it is perhaps possible to look at love in a scientific way. And I say that thinking like Shakespeare is way ahead of his time in science, because even today, science hasn't quite figured out love. But, you know, if we were to put a sort of modern perspective on it, you know those people who are like, oh, love is just a chemical balance in your brain designed to make sure you don't eat your babies. Those kinds of slightly cynical people who view love in a purely scientific sense. He is saying that is not the way to look at love. So that height be taken is like essentially the attempt to look at love in a purely logical scientific way. And it's like, yes, you can look at it that way, but even if you did, you don't fully appreciate what it can do. So that unknown, the connotations there of something immeasurable, something um, mysterious and, and incomprehensible being used with worth, and that idea of value and importance. It's stressing that knowing the sort of logical, the technicalities of love does not mean you understand the power and importance of love. So we've now looked at the first eight lines of the poem and let's recap what we've got about love so far. We've got that love stays constant. Love is unchanging even in the face of difficulty and love is something that gives us purpose and guidance and direction in life and we cannot fully appreciate the value that love has to us in our lives. We're going to go now to the next four lines. So we have this personification, first of all, love's not times four. I would add, by the way, that I think all of the negation, that pattern of negation that we have throughout the poem um, is part of creating that tone of certainty. It's like, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. Like he's sort of almost challenging all the different ideas of what love can and can't be. That's a big part of creating that tone of certainty. And he carries that on here with love's not time's fool. So time has obviously been personified in this line. And with him saying that love is not time's fool, what he's essentially saying is that love is not affected by time. Now, in terms of why he's personified time, I think there's room to argue that the way love has been written about throughout this poem, it has been given a sort of tangibility. If you think about it being something that can be altered, that can be removed, I wouldn't go so far as it's being personified, but it has been given this feel via the metaphors of like 
a star and its height being taken and something that can be changed. It's been given this tangibility that is more than it should have because it's an abstract concept that is intangible. By the way, just in case you don't know what the word tangible means, tangible is just something you can touch, right? So this pen is tangible. Freedom is not, you can't touch freedom. So he is making love feel more concrete, more real, more tangible. And I think the time is part of that. Time is part, by personifying time, he makes that also more tangible. And he presents it almost as being like another obstacle, right? It's another impediment, it's another tempest, it's time. It's a challenger, it's a threat, it's an enemy to love. Except of course, he says it's not, he is not time's fool. So he's doing that constant trick of, he sets it up that, you know, time is the enemy of love, but then completely trashes that idea just with the negation of not. And then when he says, the rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come, I'm gonna break this down so you can fully understand what this all means. The bending sickle's compass is, is it takes a minute to get, but the rosy lips and cheeks, you'll totally be able to get super easy. So the rosy lips and cheeks is more synecdoche. He's a real big fan of synecdoche as our power Shakespeare. And so it's again, it's a part of something being used to represent a whole. In this case, obviously it's a human being and all the focus is being placed on their rosy lips and cheeks. Why? To understand that, we need to understand 16th century concepts of beauty. Guess what? They considered rosy lips and cheeks very beautiful. So the synecdoche is all about beauty. So hold on to that thought, first of all, okay? Well, I'll come back to analyze what it all means in a second, but the first comprehension we need to understand is that rosy lips and cheeks is beauty. He then says, rosy lips, lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Now, his bending sickle, who is that referring to? That is referring to death. When you think about the image of death, you might think of the image of the Grim Reaper. What's the Grim Reaper holding? A scythe, Shakespeare's used the word sickle, same concept. So the bending sickle is another synecdoche because it's taking that whole of the Grim Reaper and focusing in on what he's like really associated with, what he's defined by, his scythe he uses to harvest lives. Because it, again, if you're not familiar with like farming and what a sickle or a scythe is, which let's be honest, I'm not either, I don't know anything about farming, but the basic principle is that it is a tool that farmers use to like chop crops down. It's got like a uh, round curved blade that they use to chop down crops. And so the Grim Reaper has a scythe, a sickle, because it's like he is reaping, he's harvesting human lives. So the bending sickle is all a synecdoche for the Grim Reaper for death. And it says, within his bending sickle's compass. Now for that, what is the compass? Essentially, this is where I'm gonna do a little bit of art. Are you ready to see how terrible I am at drawing? So if we think of our sickle on a super basic level, there is going to be, because it is curved, there is going to be, when it does a movement, there is going to be a circle of crops that it can manage to get within that. That's its compass. It's what it can cover in one swoop, what it can take in one swoop. So when we go back here then, what essentially is being said is though beauty within the Grim Reaper's sickle can come, beauty is within his sickle. Now, if beauty is within his sickle, that means the Grim Reaper can take it. Beauty dies. Love's not time's fool, though beauty dies. In other words, love does not decline with time, even though beauty fades. We've then got these lines, love alters not with his brief hours and week, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. So we've got a continuation of patterns we've already seen, right? We've got more of that semantic field of change being completely negated with not. So it's more of that feeling of love being constant. In this case, it's constant over time as represented, you know, we've been told love's not time's fool, even with beauty fading, even with a lot of time. So the brief hours 
and weeks is like representative of a short amount of time. And he's saying that love does not change over that short time. Instead, it bears it out. Notice again how we've got another word connoting like perseverance, constancy, keeping on going with that bearing something until the edge of doom. So we can think of that as being like the end of time till the end of everything. So you've got this juxtaposition between the short time of brief hours and weeks and the really, really long time of the edge of doom. Bears it out, keeps going. So in other words, love lasts like essentially forever, right? Love is constant and unchanging. So it's not just this idea that love can remain over time, but it's love is also unchanging over time. There is no fluctuation to love. It is constant that even over the really long periods of time. So to look at our last two lines of the poem, before I look at the specific language in them, I need to take a step back to our tone of certainty and passion, and also to the fact that this poem is a sonnet, okay? This poem is a sonnet. Specifically, it's an English sonnet. Now, English sonnets are more famously known as Shakespearean sonnets. I'm gonna refer to it as an English sonnet, in part just because of the just st super stupid and basic reason that if it doesn't matter whether you say English sonnet or Shakespearean sonnet, say the one that's easier to spell and quicker to write. So it's an English sonnet. And why does it matter that it is an English sonnet? Well, English sonnets all follow the same rhyme scheme. They are three quatrains with an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme for the three quatrains, followed by a two line rhyming couplet. So you can see if we look at the poem, you've got minds, love, finds, remove. So minds and finds, love and remove. A, B, A, B. And then it keeps going. Mark, shaken, bark, taken. C, D, C, D. Cheeks, come, weeks, doom. Now I know you're thinking, how on earth do come and doom rhyme? And I am with you there. It's an accent thing. Um, you just have to imagine that the way that Shakespeare said one of those two words rhymed. Like I've read before that there are theories that Shakespeare, because of the way the accents were at the time, kind of sounded like what we would associate with a pirate. So it's kind of like Shakespeare's being like, compass comb, the edge of dome. And it kind of, oh my God, that's gonna become some kind of hideous meme, isn't it? The point is he follows that rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Why does that matter? Well, if we think about this poem, essentially like someone putting forward their argument in a debate about love, you know, in a discussion of what is love, this person is setting forward their case. Our three quatrains, and a quick reminder, quatrains are just like four lines of a poem. He hasn't separated them out into separate stanzas, but they still come in groups of four. And we can see how they come in groups of four in a second, but they come in groups of four, three groups of four, and they are like his sort of three overarching arguments. So we can think of this first one of what love is on a sort of legal sense and what it is not. He then has his four looking at it with the C metaphor, and then he has his four looking at love and time. So he makes his case um, across those three quatrains. The two lines at the end that are a rhyming couplet, which just means they rhyme with each other. So, whoops, proved and loved. Again, you need to pirate the pronunciation there by overstressing the ed. Uh, upon me proved man ever loved. But when we have that rhyming couplet, what this becomes in our logical argument is a coda. So a coda is just a sort of conclusion to a passage of a text. And so these two lines are his coda. And that's very common in the sonnets. The two rhyming couplets are like the final conclusion, the final message of the poem. So when we read and understand these lines, what we have to understand is that what we are reading is his final like, you know, chess move of this is my conclusion, this is my end, this is my final argument. And what he says is if this be error and upon me proved, so if someone can show me and prove to me 
that everything I've just said is wrong. I've never written a poem. I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Nobody's ever been in love. So what he's saying is I am so certain that this is what love is that for you to say this is not what love is means that people haven't been in love before. Because if they have been in love, they would know I'm right. Similarly, the reason he's saying I never wrote this poem is not because it's a kind of denial of, oh, if I'm wrong, pretend I didn't say all of this. But a sonnet is a love poem. That's what sonnets are at their core. They are love poems. So when he is saying, I never writ this poem, he's saying no one's ever written a love poem. If this is not what love is, then people haven't written about love. Because when you write about love, this is what you're saying. This is what you're writing about. So if we think back to that tone of certainty, he's essentially saying, I am so certain that if I'm wrong, love poems haven't been written and I'm the freaking king of love poems and they've never been written and no one has ever loved in the history of humanity. Like those negations are so powerful in creating that tone of certainty and how he feels like he is absolutely right in his argument about love. So when we come to look at this poem overall, what we can see is that it's a freaking beautiful poem, essentially saying that love is constant, love is unchanging, love is between two people who truly connect and understand one another, love is unaffected by any obstacle, love guides us, love gives us our purpose, and if any of that is wrong, then Shakespeare, the historical king of love, even though he didn't know he was gonna have that reputation, basically has never written about love and no human being has ever loved. That's this poem in a gist. It's examining what it means to love. Who can love? People who truly understand each other. What love is not changing, fickle, and what love is persevering, constant, a guide. One final thing I wanna point out that now that we've just seen the entire poem is the fact that the overwhelming majority of the words are monosyllabic. That means they're only one syllable long. So out, to, this, be, me, nor, writ, mark, that, on, etc. They're only one syllable. So it's very simple in its language. Think about how over the top and flowery some love poems can be. This is not about that at all. This is really simple. And I think there's a really beautiful juxtaposition in the simplicity of the words with the complexity of the feelings that manages to capture the idea of love is simultaneously something so simple and so basic that humans can just do, but at the same time, huge and deep and abstract and powerful and complex. And that is why I love this poem. And I hope that you now do too. See you later.